Welcome to the Atomic Real Estate Show, Philadelphia's number one real estate podcast and a direct subs production. Real estate investing is not rocket science, and on our show, we'll delve into best practices with a focus on the small things that add up over time. Please enjoy the authentic, informative, and actionable show with our host, Paul Jagelski. Hello, and welcome to the Atomic Real Estate Show, a podcast dedicated to exploring the world of real estate investing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started in the industry, this show is for you. Join us as we dive into the latest trends and insights in the Philadelphia real estate market and hear from expert guests who share their knowledge and expertise while investing into this dynamic city. This show is brought to you by Direct Subs. Please check them out at directsubs.com focusing on building connections for investors and contractors throughout the greater Philadelphia area. The Atomic Real Estate Show is your go-to resource for all things real estate in Philadelphia. I'm Paul Jagelski, your host. Now sit back, relax, and let's explore the atomic world of real estate together. Today, our guest is Andrew. Andrew's a local investor and a real estate agent here in Philadelphia. Andrew, welcome to our show and thanks for joining us. Please introduce yourself. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. My name's uh, Andrew Simfel. I'm a uh, real estate agent and a, um, a full-time investor in the Philadelphia area. Um, I have some stuff in the city, a bunch of stuff in the suburbs, and uh, I live closer to the Lehigh Valley, so actually expanding into that market a little bit as well. So, Andrew, that's awesome, dude. Uh, thanks for joining us. I know you've been in this game for some time, uh, and you've had some fun, some ups, some downs, and some all-arounds, uh, but... I really kind of want to talk in the beginning here about flipping. Uh, so I know you're familiar with flipping. Uh, if any success or bad stories you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, just kind of like a, a play by play a little bit is that like when I, I I first started in real estate in 2013, so about 10, so 10 years ago, actually, which is uh, crazy now that I'm saying it that way. So, but yeah, I started initially where um, I was kind of always had corporate careers. And after college, um, I was kind of, I always wanted to be in real estate, but I wasn't sure how. So. I took a rich dad, poor dad class um, in Philadelphia and met a partner um, and met a guy, I should say, that I ended up partnering with uh, who had a credit line um, and knew a little bit about real estate. So um, he had a couple projects going, but he was still relatively, I guess he was not as novice as I was, obviously. He'd been doing it for a little bit, but um, you know, he was kind of looking for a change in a partner and they kind of went to the went to the seminar to you know sell some deals actually because they were wholesaling a little bit at the time so anyway i started um kind of picking his brain and walking or you know kind of following his projects and stuff and he had some rentals and some flips and uh you know basically i bugged him enough that he agreed to partner with me so i took my 401k when you know i've been working two three years so i had took my my whole 401k tapped it out used it with his credit line and we started buying in south philly um and you know we did between like 2013 and 2015, we did like, you know, 15 deals together, a couple rentals, uh, mostly flips. Um, you know, and a lot of the deals we did um, weren't that great. To your point is that flipping is, um, flipping is for me at least was not the most lucrative thing early on, right? Because for me, the timing was what always got us, right? Is that we would get contractors that we kind of knew We'd get into the deals and then, um, you know, we do the deal, everything would be okay, but basically they would balloon costs on us or they would underbid it from the start and run into things. And what we never factored in was that, um, you know, although the deal might have ended up being, you know, we sold it for more or the finishes were good, we just held it for too long on expensive money, right? So that was a big lesson we learned initially is, is, you know, you can do these things and like, you know, we were mostly in Point Breeze early on. so. We were getting really, really good deals on, you know, shells and you know, rentals and point breeze where we're we're looking at like 50 grand a shell where some of these are going for you know 200, 250 nowadays. So, you know, we were we were walking into some great deals and you know, we could screw it up in, in a year and still make money because the, the market was turning so fast in those areas. So in hindsight, I wish we would have sold less and then um also just just held on to as much as humanly possible and then even if we didn't even finish them at a certain level, we should just put a renter in there and just just cruised on it. But uh, at the time, we're borrowing them like we're borrowing kind of like hard money and other sources, you know, hard money, and we're borrowing some money off other people and just to scale and do some of these deals. And uh, ultimately, that's why we didn't hold them is just the structure of our money. If I would have known what I would have known now, and I would have had investor connections and commercial real estate lenders and people that could have had the back end for us a little bit easier. Um, I definitely think we could have held them and should have held them. 
were you GC in these projects or were you fully giving it uh, automated control over to your contractors? So I was hiring a contractor. Now I'm trying to learn as much of the business as I can. So I have a contractor there and I'm trying to go buy the jobs, you know, cause I lived in, I think Fairmount at the time. So I was still going to South, you know, working a professional job during the day uh, for a, uh, like a small thrift store company. I was an, an analyst at the time. Um, and I, after, after work, I'd stop by the jobs every day and I, every Saturday would be like a work day where I'd go to jobs, make sure everything's looking good. Uh, the thing is, is that we weren't hiring the best GC where, um, you know, it was a buddy of my, um, you know, my partner and, uh, everything would be great on the front end. And then we get halfway through the job and it would just, the cost would balloon and stuff would happen, which, which it normally does. But, you know, I feel like it was never fast and it was always more expensive and, you know, we never really lost money, but we never really made money. And the times we did make money, you're paying that top tax rate on it. And, you know, you're not even really making what you think you're going to make. Right. Because then, you know, I'm working at W2. So I'm also have like, you know, I also have an OK income at the time. Nothing great. But, you know, when you factor that in, you know, I'm not a full time real estate investor on paper or anything else. You know, you know, you're you're making a lot of money and then you're it goes right back out the door again. Right. So well, was, you mentioned a couple good things in there. Um, a real estate investor on paper or real estate professional on paper is one thing. So we'll get back to that one. Uh, but yeah, it, it W2, that's hard. I mean, if you're trying to GC and flip projects and you're working a W2 job nine to five, where at least during the majority of those working hours to check in on those guys, to make sure things are going at an actual rate is really hard to be going there after hours and then trying to give your time on the weekends. That's a tough position. And then the other thing you mentioned out of that, that I want to make sure everybody gets that flipping is a W-2 income. Uh, the government does not look at that as an investment or anything like that. They look at that as a straight up W-2 income. Um, so without that real estate professional part of it, you're getting taxed really heavily on that flip. Uh, and if you're not accounting for that upfront, that's going to eat your profits almost instantly. Uh, mm -hmm. But talk to me a little bit about the professional on uh, paper, because that's a big one. I just figured that out uh, about a year and a half ago, two years into my my real estate adventure, I realized there was this cool thing that I could do to help me on taxes. Yeah, well, not not like an act like I'm a total expert on this or anything, but I do know that it just changes how you can one how you can roll over losses and just I think how I believe it's how your losses are calculated and how many deductions you can take, right? So yeah, I yeah. So I mean, I don't I, I know that depending on years now, unless you sell a bunch of stuff, you don't pay a whole lot of you know you don't pay a huge amount of taxes being uh, being a real estate investor, right? So. That's the benefit there. You only really make the money when you sell, or you only really have to pay the taxes when you sell, right? So that's why you know people that say I never lose money, um, you know, usually either either never sell or um, you know never sell. And people that say I you know I don't make a lot of money or whatever don't sell, right? That's the key is just hold it as long as you can. And I've never done the ten thirty one stuff, but I'm actually going to start looking into doing that this year on some of my smaller ones. But yeah, I mean for the most part, that's you know. There's a there's a big transition there when you come you know as far as how the government views you and what you're able to pay and what you're able to write off once you become full time on paper so you know and I had for most of my investing career up until like you know last beginning of 2022 I was a full time you know realist I mean I was a, I had a full time W two so last year was actually the first time the first full year that I had as a um you know as a full time investor so oh dang well congratulations and welcome to the new tax brackets of uh, hell almost. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I feel, yeah. I feel like now I feel like I'm working more. I feel like I feel like my my days on the phone calls, running around the properties, and I have two little kids, so I feel like uh, I feel like I see a lot more of them, and uh, I feel like I don't work as much as I should because I'm chasing around kids a lot. But you know, it's yeah. it, it, it's worth it while they're small here. So go enjoy it. I I agree. Uh, I quit my corporate job to I call myself a stay at home dad that does real estate things on the side, <laughs> um, because yeah, it just it that time is invaluable and it's awesome. Uh, and yeah, you gotta chase your tail around sometimes, chase down some properties here and there. But it's as you say, it's all worth it because you get that actual time back with the kids, which is phenomenal. Um, and I do know that there's a couple of requirements. Again, I'm also not an expert on the professional real estate on paper, but I think it's something like 750 hours you have to work in uh, real estate and it has to be more than, or at least 50% of your W-2 job if you're trying to do it uh, can, at the same time. So that's a lot of hours if you're trying to do it as a W-2. Um, but the cool part is now you're married. Uh, so with your professionalism on paper, any income or extra deductions that you have 
that doesn't cover your income, you can actually roll over to your wife's side too. Um, and you can hide some of her income, which is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So real, so just uh, back to flips, just for the listeners out there, to anybody looking to get into flips, I would say the biggest things, biggest takeaways I have are really watch how long you hold it. Even if your numbers are right online, typically you're going to be borrowing the money at a decently high rate, especially in the lending environment right now. So just keep that in mind is keep it, hold it as little as possible. And second is just, I've always lost money as been contractors, right? And contractor delays. And, you know, I, I would say the biggest thing for me has always been the construction aspect, right? So like looking back on it, I wish I would have just quit my job at the time and just done whatever I had to do to actually just see the jobs myself. Cause one, I would have learned a lot more at faster and two, I would just have so much more control over the costs. Right. So Although that that's not always possible, um, I feel like if I would have GC that at certain points in time, I had to take over these jobs, right? Which at the time was a pain in the butt, but ultimately it allowed me to make good connections and figure out how it all comes together, right? So, I mean, you know, when that happens, it sucks, but you know, in the end of the day, you you learn you learn how it goes, and you know, I feel like it was a really good learning experience looking back on it. So, wouldn't wouldn't change it, but I'd caution any newbies on uh, on flipping unless you're getting a really good deal, you have really good structure in place, and you're getting cheap money. Um, really watch, watch out because the minute you hold that thing, you know, when you're borrowing 100 grand at 15%, whatever X percentage, and you're cutting a check for two grand every month and you're holding it for six months longer than you expect, like that's potentially a lot of your profit out the door, especially when you're when you're when you're out of your cost and you're starting out. So sometimes you, you luck into a home run deal like we actually did, but, you know, we never made anything out of it, right? But now it's even tougher, right, to get those home run type deals, so. Yeah, it's it's really tough to get those home runs considering now you know everybody is competing against you. Since the inventory is so low, it's not just investors you're competing against. You're competing against homeowners. And homeowners have this thing called a heart where they want something and they don't necessarily know the overall general price, but they're willing to pay whatever it takes. And as an investor, you're sitting there going, dude, how is this house going over? Nobody can make money on this unless you live there for 30 years and do the rehabbing. Yeah, 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 correct. Plus, like, I think when I first started, we used to do a lot. Like, I was getting, we were doing mostly share of stuff, right? And then even, like, you know, when I, after flipping and rentals and stuff, I kind of, we kind of divested that partnership, you know, amicably, amicably, but we sold our, you know, we got really, the stuff that we held, we got really good sales on, and this was mostly in the city, so. Um, this is like 2017, 2018, we sold everything off that we had that, you know, was good. We divested that partnership. And then um, I started buying some sheriff stuff from one of my buddies doing basically Burr model, but before it was really called Burr model. Um, and I started buying in the counties and that was a lot, some sheriff stuff right off the bat. And then um, I feel like recently there hasn't been much sheriff stuff because the values are so high. I don't think people are really getting foreclosed on because nobody's underwater anymore, right? It's still, it was still a wave from 2008 or whatever, but now like no one's underwater so if they you know who's they're just going to sell their house if they have to right a lot not i feel like they're not getting taken like they used to so you know i think that that stuff's still out there and i'm sure it'll come back again but right now it's not I'm not seeing much of it so yeah and i'm seeing that even if they are getting foreclosed or pre-foreclosed on they are doing that they're listing their house and it says it right there in the description this is a pre-foreclosure we need to move fast blah 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 out of it or they just sit there and you know what? Hey, you're gonna come through me, come through me, we'll go through it. And as you say, hey, maybe I'll take a home equity loan off and pay off that one. There, there's ways to get around it. Um, and agents now, we're not seeing as many foreclosures, pre-foreclosures. And you're seeing a lot of investors that have nudged their way into the bank systems where they're like, hey, before you pre-foreclose, let me know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that off your hands. And it's just making the bank's life easier and the investors are actually getting quote unquote off market deals. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's really tough right now. I know you, um, you said, you mentioned you were doing some stuff in the suburbs and the suburbs have always been something that I've looked at, wanted to get into. I can't make my numbers work, so I'm still scared about them. Um, but tell me a little bit about your suburb rentals. What are you looking for? Big yeah. places, little places. Yeah, so my uh, so one of my buddies um, kind of shot me some some sh some sheriff deals a couple of years ago. It was kind of telling me about the county, specifically Delaware County, where certain areas the, the Section Eight vouchers are really high for like you know a three bedroom and four bedroom. You're talking like a three bedroom voucher, and like you know any of these Delaware County areas are like fourteen hundred in the, a month, and then you know a, a four bedroom is like sixteen hundred a month. And when you're talking, you know hundred thousand dollar property you know those are those are pretty good numbers and the taxes are higher which kind of offsets that 
But um, I was still, I'm still, I was still really getting good buys as a pair compared to like Philly, where you know if I'm buying in Point Breeze two years ago at you know if I'm buying in Point Breeze in 2015 for you know 50 grand for a shell or whatever, 100 grand for a decent for for a rentable building, you know now I'm paying 250 for that, right? And then the suburbs, um, I, for whatever reason, I just made some good connections with some wholesalers and. Um, for the most part, the same group of wholesalers has kind of really supplied me with most of my deals recently. And you know, the past couple of years, I've been doing 10 plus deals a year. And that's just, um, you know, so a mixture of singles and small multis. Um, and, you know, my buy box is really anywhere that makes sense um, where I can kind of get a good deal. And it just as long as it's not a war zone. Right. So I underwrite everything at 8 um, percent, you know, try to try to get the taxes as low as possible. And, um, you know, I'm actually, you know, I'm, some of these other ones like I could buys on previously, I'm starting to kind of look to sell and potentially buy something a little bit bigger this year. Uh, however, I'd have to find that right by. So, um, plus I had a, a, some property management issues with a property manager in the area. So if anybody wants any property manager stories, I can tell you those as well. But uh, some I had as a result, I had a couple of evictions and stuff. So that's stuff I'm going to sell. I'm actually going to sell off. So I think ultimately it'll be a blessing in disguise in disguise because the values are really high in some of these areas. So. Um, you know, just a matter of uh, just trying to top grade my portfolio at this point. Um, plus, I plus I like you know in 2016 or 17, I was living in the city and uh, I got married. My wife was working in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and uh, I was working in Ben Salem. So I wanted to go like Plymouth, Plymouth meeting Bluebell. Um, you know, halfway between and kind of lost that battle. So I'm in Center Valley, which is uh, north of Quaker Town. But um, yeah, I've been starting to look at some areas up here. I just bought a Lehigh University rental. Um, and just kind of starting to look at some different markets as well, just because uh, I feel like my normal markets and normal buy box have kind of changed up a little bit this year. So, now are you managing all your properties yourself? I know you mentioned a property manager that kind of went south, but so yeah, have you taken all that over. Yeah, no, well, yes and no. I mean, I kind of had to get more involved. So, cautionary tales I went through a, a property manager, I had a bunch of Section 8s, and uh, what happened is uh, Section 8s, and then I had a couple that had, there were some evictions and stuff, and basically the property manager kind of went AWOL. Uh, and was just kind of lying to me and saying, hey, you know, these, this, this inspection happened, it's all good. Well, like the way the Section 8 works is that their mail goes to the property manager because they place the tenant, their phone calls, everything. And they're just telling me basically lies. And then uh, essentially, but I had a couple properties in abatement, so I wasn't getting paid on it. And then um, I kind of caught the girl in the lie where it was like, oh, I went to this inspection, but they didn't go to the inspection. So basically, I, I'm switching property managers. I had a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of like evictions as well and just my portfolio went to you know went south a little bit now it's still pretty good and my numbers are still okay i just have a couple properties coming up where i'll have to refi you know rehab them and sell them so it is what it is i, I feel like being a being a uh, landlord the numbers look bigger on paper your net worth looks big the numbers look coming in look big but it never turns out that way right so everybody out there if you want to be full-time real estate you're going to be you're going to be poor you're going to be cash poor a lot right you're on paper to look good everything will look good but you'll be cash poor right it's just the way it goes so thanks just, uh, that's my life right now yeah exactly so <laughs> yeah so anybody out there that thinks the real estate you know millionaire driving driving bentley's and whatever else you know i think the answer is yes but once you get to a certain point and uh if you have so many properties because you need a lot of these like little single properties to to, to really make up make some money right you need like you know i feel like i have like 50 units and even then i feel like i'm not there so i don't even know how many you need right you need 100 units or something but or you or you just sell a lot of them right that's the other part of it you sell it all and give up that's, that's a good way to get a lot of money so i i always think it's interesting because I, I i have two duplexes in a single family so five doors three units and uh i talk to you know investors such as yourself that have numbers that are much higher than mine and everybody when they deep dive back into it they always find you know like those little oh i let this go i let this go i let this go but you guys always have great backup plans hey i could fix it rehab it i could cash refinance it i could do this like that to me is so cool where like you've lived it you've done it you know it it's not going to stress your world out you understand the cost of doing real estate it's a big numbers game you don't lose 100 bucks you lose ten thousand. you don't make 100 bucks you make ten thousand. So it's it's not small numbers, and you got to live with it. Um, you know, I got I got one of mine coming up right now. They're moving out. It needs a kitchen. We're gonna add a half bath. It needs the basement redone. We got to revamp the half bath. And three years ago, when I jumped into this, I would have been sitting there sweating and crying and not knowing how I'm gonna do this. 
and now I can't wait for August 1st to come because <laughs> that's my rehab day. Yeah, you get to dig into it a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah and, after, and after you've been doing a little bit, you make some connections and you kind of learn, you know, what's what. You learn, you kind of get to figure out what kitchens am I going to put in this? What does stuff cost, right? And I would think that, like, most people out there, the biggest thing is just learning how to buy, right? Is that like, you got to yeah. be really, you got to be really, really strict on your buy criteria. You just can't overpay, right? Like that's the worst thing you can do. You really, they say you make the money when you buy and that's like absolutely true, right? Is that like, you know, we're probably, I'm probably buying 10% of the deals that come across my plate, right? Which means I'm looking at a lot of deals every year, right? But at the same point in time, like really just, you're, you're looking at everything where like, if the, if the sky falls, like, am I going to, am I going to at least get out of this? Right. And the answer is it has to be yes. Right. And like, will it cash flow at 8% and all the reserves put in, will it cash flow at 10%? Cause you know, I think the rate environment will get a little bit better, but um, for the time being, you can't, you can't be losing money every month. Right. So, um, you know, that, and that, and like, I think people just need to be realistic. Like I've, I've already got to the point where I bought too many deals at once, right. Where you just have stuff sitting on the shelf and it's like, I don't have enough cash coming in for seven crews or whatever, but you know, in the end of the day, I think that was the right move at the time, but it's also a lot of money just sitting there. Right. So, you know, I would, the shelf. I, yeah, I think buy when you can buy. And what I started doing is if I can't, if I feel like financially, it's going to be a little bit tight for me to buy, like I'll start a partnership with a money guy. Right. So I started that recently where one of my, you know, one of my money guys and myself bought uh, a couple prop four prop or I guess five properties, nine units together, uh, like a couple weeks ago. And that was just because there were deals that made sense that um, if I took them down myself, it would work, but I would just be too tight on cash. So, you know, it's one of the things where just, you know, partner, partner up with somebody. If you're not sure, bring, yeah. bring, bring the money, don't bring the experience and you, you know, bring the, bring the experience, bring the money, whatever, split it up. Hey, they say there's three legs to real estate, the money, the experience slash knowledge, and then the contract inside of it. Uh, so if you can bring two, find the third, or if you can't, you go find them and then that you make the, the way the deal work. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's what, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that's one of the cool things about real estate is just like it, there's always an answer. It's just whether or not you're look, willing to look for the answer and go that route. Yeah. And what I did to mitigate that second part is I don't buy full guts anymore, right? If it's a great deal and it's a full gut, I won't do a full gut. It's just because I've learned my lesson the hard way, hard way, at least like, you know, most of my, most of my places are kitchens baths, right? Full guts. I just, I feel like I've never made money just because they've always, the deals have always lasted longer. Now I know ultimately that's the right way to do it is you buy it cheap and then you have less maintenance costs overall and whatever else. But for me, at least I try to not, I try to buy areas that aren't full guts, but I still try to update all the kitchens, all the baths, stuff that I know is going to fix, right? Like need fixing, right? I mean, still, that's not necessarily the right answer for most people, right? All new systems are better, but that's just not that. That's that model hasn't worked for me. But the uh, the new one, all, all new, all new uh, exterior and not not open up the walls has worked out better for me. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I look for the same thing. I look for a good structure, a good roof, and then anything interior for the most part, as long as there's good floors, I don't really care because um, I'm not going to be tearing it all the way down. I might change a room or a wall here or there. Um, but yeah, kitchens, bathrooms, maybe floors. That's what I look for. I call them the grandmom houses, uh, little rehabs. I know people who do the full guts. They keep telling me to get into them. You're absolutely right. I know it's the right way to go, but it's just one of those scare tactics to me of timeframes. I haven't, I haven't done it yet, so it still scares me. Got it. I've, uh, I've, done, I've done it too many times, and I feel like I haven't. I have. I don't have the crew to master that. Right. I don't have the guys that are. I have. I have all the individual traits, but without being the guy that's pulling the permits and doing that whole thing. Right. That's not. You know, doing all of that effectively in a good time frame is what I haven't. What I've just never been great at. Right. And, I think ultimately, if I was going to do that, I would have to like I would physically be the one GCing it. I would get licensed and then just you know do all that from there. But um, you know, for the most part, I just run all my own jobs, just not not intensive like that, where I'm not necessarily pulling every permit in the world because I'm not ripping out all the walls. Right? It's just trying to be cosmetic. I have good, good, really good guys that work for me. I have good trades, and you know, just a matter of just running it. But um, logistically, is slightly tough because I have stuff all over the place. Right? I have a couple in Pottstown. I have a couple in Coatesville. I have a couple in Delco. I have this one I just bought in Bethlehem. I have a one in the city. So kind of all over the place. But you know, that's part of having a good. You know, I feel like I started scaling when I did stop self managing and having a good manager. So uh, last manager kind of went a little sideways, but uh, I have a new another management company that's been really really good. So. Um, you know, I would say to caution, cautionary tale to anybody, if you see any signs of worry with a property manager, just immediately address it and don't 
don't just think, oh, well, this is just a this is just a little blip on the radar. Because the problem I've found is that like the property manager controls so much that you know you lose you know you kind of lose a little bit of I don't know I I wouldn't say like visibility, but like the tough part is the property management firm I'm gonna I'm going to right now kind of has like they have an inspections department, they have like a maintenance department, they have a bunch of different departments. So you kind of, there's kind of checks and balances versus the guy that I was with before, um, you know, their girl handles it all. So if they don't do something, there's no check and balance, right? It's just what they say, really. Um, you know, there's not, it's not like there's somebody else there that's looking at what she's doing all day. She's got a hundred properties and she says she does something, they take it for the take it for that word, right? And she gets a check cut for the municipality, you'd think that they get it, right? But it, ultimately it's, you know, it's not. So I caution everybody to be pretty strategic on who you're using with, you know, good references and everything else. And, you know, although I do like to support the small, the small guy, the bigger guys that are split up in different departments and have more checks and balances is really what I, I found somebody should be looking for. So, well, you mentioned something there. Great. Make sure you do your homework um, because there's different property managers for different investors. You know, um, as you say, there's big ones that have all the different departments, all the checks and balances. And hey, if you want to be that outside investor where they have that control and you know it's in good hands, that's a place to go. There's small ones where, hey, they all they're doing is literally finding you a tenant and sending you the maintenance calls. That they're just that middle person. You want to be involved, they'll be you can be all the involvement you want. Uh so yeah, make sure you interview property managers. Um, I know for myself, I have not gotten to the point where I can trust a property manager because as you said, you are giving up a lot of control. Uh, you don't necessarily know the tenant that's going in there. You don't necessarily know the maintenance that's physically being done. Is it being done properly or is it just being duct taped and called done? Um, are you being charged for duct tape of $350 that should have been soldered properly? Uh, so yeah, property management, it's it's a scary, it's a scary handoff. But there's investors out there uh, that that's how they run their business is that, you know, they take that eight to 10% right off the top. They know it's going to a property management and that's how they do it. Um, for me, I'm actually physically in the process of starting my own property management company because I want to run it. I want to know what's going in there. I want to know how it's being inspected. I want to know that everything's going checks and balances. And I've got two little boys that, you know what, they got to grow up one day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> some calls, boys. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, you know what? I'll teach them at nine and five that this is where you check this and this is how you check that and this is where you go to that. Yeah. There you go. Start sending them out on inspections sooner than later, right? Why not? Hey, they get to see a cool angles, you know. Send them a camera. Go tell them take pictures of anything you think is broken. <laughs> go back. Crawl, crawl space looks pretty good on this one. Pretty clean. There you go. <laughs> Between the uh, second floor and the the roof, there's only about that eight inches on those row homes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Send them in there. <laughs> Uh, and then I can start paying them. What is it, fourteen thousand a year, and hide that off the taxes? Or uh, absolutely, I think that's like the tax-free. That's like the tax-free gift number, right? So there you go. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I've got my whole plan for my kids, and you know what? When they turn thirteen, they're gonna be like, "Yeah, Dad, we're we're not doing real estate." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Going to we're going to we're going to seven years of school. We're going to a bunch of school though. So you go ahead and start making some money in real estate then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, at that point, they'll be. I'll be like, yo, yeah, you pay for college or you come join real estate. <laughs> Those are your options. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, and and one other thing I wanted to uh, touch on earlier. One thing I did in, in my career early on, when 2015 in Philly, I bought a triplex as an owner occupied. So being an uh, agent at the time, right? What I did is I did um, it was like 378 grand, and I did a max seller's assist as part of the deal. So I did a five percent seller's assist, um, an FHA loan, and I took my commission as a down payment for the loan. So I got into this no money down at this triplex in Fairmount, and then um. Every couple of years as a tenants moved out, I've totally this this one I've fully full gutted each each level. It had common heat when I got it, and now you know the heat's sectioned off and everything else. And now that's like my best property, right? It's 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 in you know a great area, Fairmount, no worries, no nothing hands off. It's paid for itself, you know, it's worth three twice what I bought it for, you know, two and a half times what I bought it for. And it's just been a great investment. So that's been a really, really good one. So I'd advise anybody like looking to get into it. I would say that that owner occupied 
Um, you know, multi is a good one. And uh, even if you don't live there, right? Because I actually, I had a mailbox there and all my mail went there, but I like, I was rehabbing a unit. So I didn't, theoretically, I didn't live there, right? The unit was just gutted when I, during the time period that I had to actually live there. So I didn't sleep there, right? I lived there, but I didn't sleep there. So that was one, uh, that was a good one I did. And then um, another one that I did along that is that I, that worked, that model worked great for me. So I tried it again. And I did one in grad hospital with duplex and it turned out to be the worst deal I ever did. Right. And, um, that was another cautionary tale for the, the folks out there is that there was amazing block, great building, um, you know, right at 20th and fifth water, um, and Bainbridge, like the best view, best view of the city from a, like a roof deck and in a city, it was just an amazing place, great block, great everything. Uh, and then ultimately what we found out is I started to pull out the kitchens and baths and it just had all kinds of structural issues that I didn't encounter. And it didn't account for. So ultimately it didn't end up making any money. And the lesson I learned out of that is that I didn't buy it within my normal investor numbers, right? I bought it as if I was going to live there and put a kitchen and bath in versus what happens if I have to like full gut this thing and rent it out or what happens if I have to really like take this thing apart. And ultimately I didn't do well on it. I, I didn't lose. I don't think I lost money, but I broke even because it was like a $250,000 rehab. Um, because when we pulled out the kitchen, we realized all the floor joists were cut for plumbing and the thing was hold, being held up by the floors basically. So had to basically rip out the entire center of the building. Um, so learned that the hard way is that if you want to live there, um, and do that model, it's great, but make sure you're underwriting it as if like the whole, like, you know, if you have to rent it for both units, are you still going to be within your numbers? Cause at this particular one, the rents weren't high enough to justify, it as an actual investment, right? So that was the tough lesson I learned there was, you know, always look, if you're gonna, it's gonna be an investment, always look at it as an investment, right? If it has to stand alone, can it stand alone? Because this particular one couldn't. So, although it would have been great for me to live there, um, ultimately at the same time, I got engaged like a year later and we ended up moving out of the city anyway. So I don't think I looked at it, I didn't look at it as if what happens if I have to put all this money into it, am I gonna get out of it? So that's another lesson for people is, uh, you know, the owner occupied thing is amazing and do it all day long, but you got to make sure it stands on itself. You can't live there. So Andrew, you literally went to like real estate you for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I got a lot of, I got a lot of screw ups. Uh, so, you know, you learn from your mistakes and I feel like I got a, I got more lumps than most. Right. So I'm still waiting on my, I'm still waiting on the smooth sail path, uh, path out of here, but you know, ultimately, well, you, you mentioned different. you had kids, so I don't know if there's a smooth sailing with the kids now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and, I, and ultimately, like I ended up, you know, the, the lessons you learn ultimately end up making you, you know, where you are, right? So I feel like the deals I'm doing now are much better because of the deals that I did that weren't as good, right? And you know, I I feel like a lot of it's learning the job for everybody, but if uh, if if two minutes of this podcast can save somebody fifty grand, um, I'll give you my address after the podcast, and we'll you know we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll give me, <laughs> Give me, give me a little finder speed for saving you some money. <laughs> Take a one percent referral fee on that. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> no, dude, it's it, the best part is is like yes, you went through real estate. You you learned your lessons. It cost you some money, but you sit here today smiling. Um, you've taken those lessons. You've learned from them, and you've made it successful because of those lessons. Uh, and that's awesome. I mean, to be able to just stand there, take the punches, and go because that is real estate. There is no there's no lagoon or bay with no wind and perfectly blue water that you get to sail through. It's an ocean. <laughs> yeah, there's 50 foot waves sometimes and other times there ain't nothing and you're just sitting there stagnant. So uh, it's a great ride. It's a fun ride. It, I've, I've enjoyed my almost four years in it. You've been in it for 10. So I'm sure you've been enjoying it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I like your lessons, man. You, you, you've got some everyday lessons that people can really, really learn from out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you gotta try, gotta try, man. You gotta, uh, gotta just hope that none of these hope I learned enough lessons now. I'm sure I'll keep learning lessons, but can't make any of those same mistakes again. Right. So exactly. Well, that's the thing. Don't do it twice. Now, do you do crunch all your own numbers? Yeah, I do. I mean, I kind of have it down to a, a science where like the certain areas I buy in, right? Like, uh, you know, some of the Delaware County areas, for example, I know exactly what I can pay on the basis of where the rents are. And, uh, you know, after a little while, you just kind of get a process. Plus, I always I know where my, you know, commercial lenders or private lenders are and everybody else. So I kind of know what I need to underwrite it to. So I mean, I'll still run a sheet on it. But you know, it's a quick, it's a quick snapshot, right? Like, it'll take me 10 minutes now to 
through what might have taken me a couple hours before, right? Just because I built that process. And, you know, ultimately, now that I know what the front end and the back end is, ultimately, most of the time you get a deal, I'll make an offer on every deal, right? There's chances are it's just not going to get accepted because I'm probably not not lower, not lower or higher than anybody else. Um, I started partnering with some wholesalers recently to send out some mail up here in my local uh, local market. And uh, that, that got me the first rental here. So I started sending out a little bit of mail because uh, I felt like I wasn't getting a great flow. So, Oh, man, dude, mailers. I haven't heard mailers in a long time. Um, I still get them. But that's nice to see that it's still working because, yeah, people haven't mentioned mailers recently. Yeah. Uh, we use them in the real estate world to do for, you know, houses being sold and stuff like that to get the neighborhoods all up. But, yeah, in, in the investment side, I haven't heard mailers in a while. Nice. Yeah. Well, like once you get a bunch of properties, too, like you get mail. Like, you know, the reason why I kind of started thinking about it is that I started getting mailers all the time. Like, you know, the, I, I get like these like postcards almost every day, like about certain properties. Like, are you interested in selling it? You know, ultimately, when I did my own, um, you know, partnering with a couple guys that knew more than me, uh, it, you know, it, it was actually more successful than uh, anticipated. And a lot of it is older people that are looking to sell or, you know, um, ultimately, that's been like the model that I've been buying from is tired landlords. And, um, you know, well, that would pretty much tired landlords, honestly, has been the model. And like, even now in my realtor business, like I'm representing a seller that um, is looking to sell, a, you know, a decent portfolio. And it's actually an OK deal. Um, which we're not listing or anything, but it's just because he wants to get out of the game, right? So it's those are the opportunities where if you're able to structure it right, and nail it right, you know, you can you can pick off you know pretty good little business. So, do you ever um, represent any of your tenants if they want to buy houses? I uh, no, because I try not to know my tenants, right? Okay. I try not to have my tenants know who I am. I'm trying not to because like ultimately, if I'm paying property managers, right? Like I have a lady now that's been sending me emails left and right about a security deposit return, even though I have a property manager, right? So like, I try not to like my LLCs are, I used to have like my last name, like simple realty LLC used to be named one of my LLCs. But what I was finding is I would get all these messages on Facebook and stuff, you know, and like, Hey, do you own this or that? Or, Hey, what's up with my water, whatever. So like ultimately now it's all kinds of random LLCs and I try not to be connected to it. Not that there's a problem with that. It's just, if I'm paying a property manager, I just didn't want to be involved with the day to day and have people contacting me left and right and, you know, being upset at me because there's stuff on the sidewalk behind the house or something like, you know, I, you know, yell, I, if I pay my property manager to get yelled at, I don't need to get yelled at. So, well, that's the thing you pay the property manager. If you pay the property manager, you're literally paying somebody to be that third person. So all you're hearing about is either the big bads or the big wins. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and although it was like, although, um, you know, ultimately I had a bad experience with the last one, like I feel like at least with the number of units I have now would be like not sustainable. People do do that and self-manage, but, um, you know, I, I feel like that would be such a massive part of my job would be just where a massive part of my day would just be collecting rents and taking phone calls. Right. And, you know, now at least, you know, now at least with a competent property manager taking all the phone calls and everything else, like, Hopefully that hopefully things run a little smoother. Now you still have to get involved. You still have to look at your statements. You still have to look when the money's coming in. You still have to manage your own property, right? And just without taking the calls and having to collect the money, it's nicer just to get some direct deposits and everything else and call it a day. So true passive income. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then like that, that, that was like, you know, early on, like I said, with what everybody, it, I just feel like having my name on it was a little bit was ended up even being just a little bit more of a hassle so now my llc's are kind of random so <laughs> there's your next uh llc random llc yeah, random llc or like you know i have one where my dogs I, my dog's names are like l or, or like l reese ella so reese ella and like biscuit so it's like you know rbe partners llc or something like that which you know, it doesn't, it, it's still me, right? It doesn't matter. And they could still, it did still track it down to me, like theoretically, but it's just not, it's not like somebody's going to go on these Google, Google simple realty, like, oh yeah, you, okay, cool. I got you. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, no, uh, I, I'm sorry. I just did my first LLC to start this whole property management thing. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's still you. It's just, all it is, is just a social security number for the government to tax something else, whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. So you just created a new kid, and it's not a kid; it's just a business, and it's just something that the government wants to be taxed. Which I found out, even if it doesn't take income, they still want you to be able to file taxes, saying I did no business last year. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just a nice little filing fee you got to pay. It's the way it's the name of the game. So. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, my accountant got that one from me, and he was like, 
dude, what are you doing? I was like, I didn't do any business. I didn't think I had to tell you about this. <laughs> He's like, yeah. yeah, what I what I did is what I do is sometimes I have those on the shelf is that I won't apply for the EIN until until you actually start uh, doing business because uh, then you don't have to like theoretically the entity is created, but when the EIN I think is what triggers that. So that's yeah. something I've done before where I've created the LLC, have it on deck for whatever you're going to do, but then apply for the EIN and then it becomes live is what I've you know that that's gotten me out of having to file blank tax returns a couple times <laughs> so how many llc's do you own do you know like five or six um, okay. everybody has like an own everybody has like their own like rule as far as like yeah. how many properties you put in each one how much value and i always try to do like you know i don't i don't even want to put a dollar down to it but like whatever sounded like a lot of money at the time like six or seven properties or a million bucks or whatever it works out to be so a lot of it too would be like different areas like if i'm doing one in a totally different area um, sometimes too, it's just with different partnerships. You have different LLCs, so uh, you know, like uh, I, you know, our, you know, one of our mutual friends. We have an LLC together, um, and then you know, I have another one with different partner, and I have like three or four other ones. So it just depends. I mean, part of it for me was area. Part of it's dollar amount and exposure. Other part of it's like how many units are in this or in these properties. So let's keep those a little compartmentalized. So, man, do you use uh, umbrella insurance? I do. I have an umbrella over uh, over everything. So. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like, like a full or over each LLC and then a big one. Uh, a full over every property. Okay. Yeah, right. um, I believe, and I think it's a couple million bucks. But yeah, that's that's one thing I've always tried to do, right? Is like insurance is one of those things where you know you don't need it until you need it, right? And I feel like every time I've had a claim, they haven't covered it. But regardless, um, you know, uh, got to keep got to keep that and like the you know the umbrella stuff is not a huge cost for whatever the no. risk tolerance no. is, especially because you, you know. If you get in some of these, like, you know, you, you hear some horror stories about slip and falls and whatever else. And it's just one of those things you got to just, you got to keep it. it stinks. But that's part of the reason why you got to be tight in your numbers, right? Because insurance is expensive and it's going to keep getting expensive. So, well, yep. um, insurance, uh, umbrella insurance. And actually, last year I started paying um, the sewer line insurance. I think it's like six, seven bucks a month per property. It's not bad whatsoever. Uh, but I knew a couple clients that weren't doing it. They never paid it. And then that, yeah, their water main broke and I saw those bills out of it. Um, and then I had a client that actually had two of his break within like six months of each other. And he had the insurance and he was perfectly fine out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's one thing too that like everybody, all investors have to be conscious of, at least in our area, is that almost every suburb, like municipality, is now doing sewer lateral inspections as part of the purchase and sale process. Um, and as realtors, we started seeing that quite a bit. But that's one of those things where, like, before I put an investment under contract, a lot of times I'll get it scoped, or at least I'll put it under contract before I drop a deposit or something. I'll get it scoped because um, ultimately that's a big expense that you're responsible for if if something happens, right? So that's something where people overlook as an investment, where you you know you you think oh, I put this under contract, it's an as is sale, but then you got a sewer lateral day one for seven grand, and it's like oh this isn't that good of a deal anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah so so that's. So that's one thing too is that like almost every one of these municipalities is doing it now and i think they're all going to migrate to it just because you know ultimately from what i understand it's not they're the municipalities don't care about sewer going in your yard it's about storm water penetrating and them having to treat additional storm water so i mean as long as you know i think it's going to just continually be an issue here and everywhere pretty much and as these houses get old you know if you if you get you know any of these old Philly houses, if you're going to scope five of them, like, you know, one of them probably has a bad sewer lateral, right? They're almost every house has them. So that's a keyword for investors. If you're going to the burbs, do it, you know, get it scoped because uh, yeah. chances are you're going to be required to anyway. I like how the suburbs personally are doing the scopes and the sidewalks. Um, you know, that was one of the big reasons why we moved out of the city was for sidewalks, for strollers, for bikes and stuff like that for the kids. And I like, hey, listen, you want to sell your property, it's got to be in a good condition. Um, and you know, Havertown has a, a policy where it's a pain in the ass. It sucks, but any pipe that enters into the ground has to have a backflow valve onto it and they will come in and they will inspect it and they will not let you go through the sale until that's in and put in by a licensed plumber. Um, and to me, the first time I ran into it, I was like, son of a bitch, but 
once you actually learn why and what it's for, the pipe, the valve itself is not expensive. I think it's like 25 bucks. A plumber can put it in on under half an hour. You pay them maybe 50, 75 bucks, put it in. So for under $150, you can get it done. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it's for the backflow. You know, God forbid that storm drain overflows and it comes back. It's not coming into your house. Um, and so I like what the suburbs are starting to do. I wish the city would pick up on some of these more stringent things for selling that they would actually check out and rather than just being like, seal of approval, you're sold. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, as an investor in the city, I'm also not complaining about that either. Yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like Philly was relatively easy to do business in. Unless you're trying to evict somebody or eject somebody, it's, it's like a great place to do business. So, you know, and I, like I said, like I was one of those things where once I got the city totally figured out, then um, I stopped by, I stopped getting deals in the city and then had to go learn all new areas. So, yeah, no, the city, I agree with you. The city is very easy except for evictions. Um, I mean, they make rental license a little bit of a pain in the ass to get, uh, but it, 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 whatever, get yeah. your rental license, pay it, whatever. Yeah, my only uh, Philly property, I had to do a lead dust search <laughs> last year, which was the first, the first for me, but I guess that's a, that's a necessary thing now. That is a necessary thing now um, to the point where the city actually, I renewed one of my rental license and it was three months before that became like a mandate and they held my renewal until after the mandate and then came back and were like, nope, can't do it. You know, have the testing. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. Yeah, they were, they were ahead of you on that one. They knew, they knew what, they were, what was going on. There. <laughs> I thought I was going to get them. I was like, oh yeah, I'll renew early. Okay, I got this. Yeah, no, they... They got me on that. Um, and again, it's uh, about $150 to get somebody to come out and test to $300, depending on how many rooms are in the house. Uh, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour and a half, again, depending upon the rooms. It's, it is what it is. Paint your windowsills. Don't let tenants put anything on your windowsills. Uh, honestly, take out carpets because it's going to hold on to all the dust and where the lead is actually used, unfortunately, is in the paint on our roads. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Philadelphia allows us to use lead-based paint on our roads. So you walk on it and then you bring it in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's lead-based paint sucks. Yeah. And to, to your point too, like one other thing I kind of learned too for is that um for rentals, right? A lot of times now I started trying to get away from carpet, especially on the first floor, which is like trying to do LVT and then trying to do like some sort of granite or some sort of stone countertop. And the reason being is that just for unit turns and abuse, it's just so much better, right? So no. like that's one thing I'm finding out, especially like, you know, to, to your point, like you, know, you have carpets there and then you're failing that lead test five times. We'll put LVT in and then you don't have to worry about it for a couple of terms. So. Nope. Yep. <laughs> um, and the LVT, honestly, I, I used to put in the the cheaper stuff, like around $2, 250. Now I'm going up to like 350 to 425 ish, just because they click in easier and they hold a little bit better. Um, and they come with like the rubber mat on the back. But yeah, I love LVT. Uh, I'm about to put in a whole first floor and a basement out of it just because it looks nice. It goes well. It turns over really well. I keep a box in every unit in the bottom. So God forbid one, you know, goes bad. You can pop it out, put it in a new one. Um, but yeah, I, I use LVT actually now almost everywhere, even the bathrooms. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do too. I do too. There's like Pergo makes a, like makes one that looks like marble tile that I've been yeah. Yeah, uh, and it looks real nice, and it's, it's almost like a seamless, not seamless, like a grouted seam on it. it there, there's some really nice ones out there yeah. um, to the point where one of my properties, I had about a box and a half left over, and it was a clearance, so I couldn't bring it back. I actually did an accent wall out of it. Oh. Um, and it came out really nice, to be, surprisingly enough, because there was I, I either needed to skim coat the wall and then paint it. <laughs> I was not ready to skip gain it. So I was like, yeah, let's see if this works. <laughs> hey, there you go. I got you. Do you do all your own work on all your own properties? Um, every property I do more. So I started off on the first kitchen and tried to do it myself and realized I was in over my head. Uh, so the next three kitchens and five bathrooms I brought in, my buddy was a contractor. Uh, a couple of my, uh, my brother-in-law's buddies who are plumbers and electricians who are now on my like go-to list. Um, but I try and do anything in front of the walls. So I'll hire an electrician for behind the walls. I'll hire a plumber for behind the walls. Anything in front of it, I'll try and do on my own because if it goes bad, I can just hire somebody to go fix it. 
Um, and I'll do all my own tiling, all my own flooring. This is going to be my first kitchen coming up in August. That's why I'm excited. To, I'm going to try and do all on my own. My contractor's like, yo, dude, I'll be on call. You just let me know. <laughs> uh, so I, I also use it as the excuse to buy new fun tools and, you know, pack my shit full of crap that my wife looks at me and is like, really, Paul? But yeah, I could pay a contractor $1,500 or I can go buy a $500 saw and do it myself. So it's, right, it's a write-off for you now, right? So you're yeah. good. Exactly. Uh, so I get to expand my toolbox and then I get to write off out of it. Uh, I'm about like this year I, to start this company. I'm just cashing out some bonds that I've had, you know, sitting in my drawer and matured. And she's looking at me. She's like, you're such an idiot. Hold those for the rainy day. Those are for the rainy day. And I'm like, nah, don't worry. We'll have deductions. <laughs> we'll take care of it. <laughs> so yeah, it's the fun stuff of real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, as you get used to, like, as you do a couple more of those, like a couple more of those deals, like you're doing now, right. And you start figuring it out, you'll start to get a process where you know which kitchen you're going to put in, what size, where you're going to get sourced the floor, you know, and ultimately it gets the easier and easier every time. But when you're start when you're starting out, it's, it's each time you're doing, it gets tougher and tougher until you get a process. Yeah. Uh, I have learned, listen, cabinets. I don't go to Lowe's. Don't go to Home Depot. I don't try and source those myself. I hire a cabinet company. Paul from Mainline Kitchens, he's phenomenal. He comes out, he gives you a brand new kitchen design. He'll work with you how you want your layout. Um, he'll work with you with costs and all that kind of fun stuff. And he gives you good cabinets. They're soft closed. They're made out of actual plywood and natural wood, not pressed. Um, they've lasted. They hold up. Uh, they got warranty on them. So I've learned him. And not to mention, he gives me blueprints. So it makes my life real easy out of it. Uh, countertops. I'm all over the place. As long as your price is good, they're all pretty much. I, I use a couple of different companies. Whoever can get it out there faster and cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, floor and decor has been one of my favorites for flooring, just because they always have something going on a huge clearance, and I'll just buy the pallet out of it, throw it into whatever. Um, and then I just signed up for Lowe's Pros to see if that's actually worth it. Gotcha. We'll see, my man. It's this is a year of. Uh, year of taking steps out of my my normal <laughs> yeah yeah what i what i do like for a lot of my stuff is like even home depot has like a thing where you can register cards and then my guys would go there at phone sale and it's just like hey hey i'm, I'm here for somebody picking up material just be like card one two three four right and then boom they'll just it's just easy so that's what that's mostly what i've been doing yeah and, and, and as you say you find those processes um, yeah exactly like i have a i have a company that comes in and they do they'll do the lvt and they'll do carpet for you right off the bat so i try to just i try to just throw that all to them right just to eliminate that process and then um I typically get out like you know i typically get cabinets from the same guy each time i typically get the same uh countertop from the same guy each time and just just try to simplify it but that was the biggest thing i found is that like if i pay guys to buy the lvt bring it whatever else i'm cheaper paying a, a company to come out and just do it all in one shot right so it's just getting it, it's getting your efficiencies down and then figuring it out well and that's a key word the efficiency so all right somebody in my position great i can get i could do a floor in about two days but i gotta go shop it i gotta bring it there and so forth so we'll say a total of three days where you're paying a company yeah you might pay quote unquote double the price because it's their labor but they'll get it done in one day you just gained two days back that a painter electrician a plumber or somebody else can be in there correct yeah and i used to i used to run around and drop off stuff at jobs and i used to have a pickup truck and kind of got out of that right because it just gets to a certain point where it's like your time is worth more than the 30 bucks you're going to save by bringing something somewhere right and like occasionally you still got to take stuff places but try to minimize that as much as possible, right? Work smarter, not harder, as they say. So. Yep, exactly. Um, and, you know, for me, I looked at this one and my wife and I actually ran two budgets on this one. Do we hire it out and I just kind of GC it and go for it? But that still puts us at a, a, not the ideal rental time. So it doesn't really like our time frame on this one doesn't really matter. If it's a three month project or a five month project, we're still in the bad rental months anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's a good point to what you just brought up is that a lot of people don't factor that in where if it takes you an extra month to do the property and your rent is X out, let's say your rent's 1400 bucks, uh, your estimate rent's 1400 bucks and your mortgage is a thousand bucks, right? Like that's 2,500 bucks a month. You know, really you're not losing the rent, but that's like an opportunity cost. But when you look at it like that, it's a big number to, to keep these things sitting vacant, which I, I'm guilty of doing in the past, right? Of, of you know, getting a good buy but if it sits for too long is it still a good buy i mean i, I don't i don't i mean I, I would say yes at times but like 
you know, just talking through right now doesn't sound like it, right? <laughs> right. Well, and, and to your point, back to what you said with your numbers, it all depends upon your numbers and your exit strategies. Um, so, you know, if you sat there and you said, yeah, this is a great buy and I can get it done in six months. And then all of a sudden you sat on it for six months and now you're just starting to work on it. And then all of a sudden you're trying to sell it in February because now it's a year rather than the six months you thought. Yeah. Those three hits right there are going to take away all your profits and everything. Um, so yeah, that, that's why, as you said earlier, you have to have those extra points. This is the plan. This is my B, this is my C and God forbid bid life goes to shit <laughs> this is what i'm gonna do with it yeah um because if exactly. you don't you're underwater in the first month exactly because if you do enough deals right you're gonna have good deals you're gonna have bad deals and you're gonna lose money and it just is what it is it's just the way just the way this way of the land right but um ultimately everybody is everybody gets at the same level but uh you know as i caution everybody as it as you as you build more you, you feel like you get way more assets i feel like i always have way less cash so that's a fun lesson i learned uh Learned the hard way as I got here, but um, you know, you know, being somebody too, like you know, being being a realtor too, like you know, that's been pretty consistent for the past couple of years. This past year has been a little slower than most because of the just because of the general market. There's not a whole lot of houses out there to to sell, but um, you know, in general, you got to keep some kind. I feel like you got to keep some kind of other income flowing in, right? Because um, you know, you need a lot of these rentals for them to really work out. But ultimately, that uh, that end of the rainbow where you're, you know, you're totally passive and all these deals are paid off and your cash flow is huge right that's what we're all trying to get to right so you know yeah, hopefully and, someday right and then once we get 10 of them paid off we're gonna be like oh time to refinance yeah oh time to refinance oh let's buy another because ultimately i think we're all just deal junkies right it's the thrill of the deal you see it you see it you're like oh i shouldn't buy this but i'm gonna buy it right and it's just like it's not a gamble it's not like being like a gambler or anything else right it's just like the thrill of the deal right like it's yep. Doing it, doing a deal is what we do, and that's 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 who we are, right? And finding deals, and you know, that's part of the reason too. Like I, I'm, I, you know, kind of like partnered up with other people because I want to do as many deals as I can, right? Because I think that ultimately buying something that's a good deal is always makes sense, right? Like even I'm noticing that now that I had a couple of these property manager things went south, but my numbers are great on these properties. So once I get them back over, put a couple grand into them, and I'll end up doing well just because I bought them right, right? So that's the. That's the key is no bad, no bad buys. After I learned all those lessons, no bad buys, right? So uh, I, uh, I always equate us to like bartenders in the everyday world. We want that quick cash and we want to turn around and spend it on something fun and exciting. And then we want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like, uh, we're, you know, we're one of those people too, where you can't be into like the instant gratification, right? Like you gotta be in it for the long, the long game, right? Like my, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm like 30, I'm 35. Right. And my wife is too. So we're like the peak of millennials. Right. And my wife is one of those like, boom, 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 need it. Now I'm going to die if I can't have it today. Well, it's like, Hey, you're, we're in the long game here. You know what I mean? Like it's, you know, it'll ultimately pan out, but you know, it's not, it's not going to be, the, it's not going to be flowers and rainbows and we're not going to go cash and checks and buying, you know, buy Rolls Royces tomorrow. Right. It's just not, it's just not going to work out like that. So. Yeah. Totally. I, um, we're kind of similar. My wife, when I first now, mind you, this is her brother who was doing all this beforehand. So my brother-in-law, so he he has all the advice and all the information. And she was very much the if I don't see this instantly. What's the point of it? Uh, and our first deal that we did out of it, she was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. And now she's looking at me and she's like, all right, Paul, when are we going to be doing the next deal? We need to have like the, the bank account's actually going up that it's going above our threshold we need to actually bring it back down we need to go get a deal done i'm like i'm sorry honey it's just not a good time I'm like i can't find anything stock market put dump it on the stock market right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because, yeah I, she she saw it uh it's not instant it took three and a half years but she started seeing you know we went and got an actual cpa so he actually sits down with us does our taxes and her eyes every year go Really? And I'm like, Shh, don't, don't question it. <laughs> He's the expert. We give him our stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing too, is like building your team, right? So I have a CPA, like it took me two CPAs to get to the one, but now I have a CPA that's great, right? Where we just work hand in hand. And then my CPA firm is now doing my bookkeeping too. So, you know, that's another advantage of the property manager where I get all the statements. I put them right to the bookkeeper. So my taxes are good. Everything is clean. It's easier from lending. It's much easier for taxes. Cause like, you got to a certain point where like you're bringing my, i'm bringing my accountant like literally a week worth of work for her like a huge folder of stuff and it's just like here you go so just you know that definitely that definitely makes it a whole lot easier right just having all your ducks in a row and having everything ready to go so but 
Yeah, yeah I'm I'm I guess like a management company. Uh, I don't want to. So that's why I'm starting that property management company because I want to have my ducks in a row, but I don't want to pay anybody right now because I need to justify not having a full time job. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. And uh, you know, once Thanks. you get once you get your processes built out, then you can scale the business a little bit and uh, you know figure out what you need, what you don't, and uh, you know we can have a one off call offline, and I'll tell you what not to do. I'm like, <laughs> Sweet. So, Andrew, after all this stress and everything, on a daily, weekly basis, how do you unwind? Um, I, I try to like you know meditate and uh, just try to. I, I used to really work out a lot, and I used to try to meditate every day. And you know, it kind of goes on and off with that, right? And um, but working out really and just trying to clear your mind. Um, I'm in a lot of I'm in like a mastermind group, and I do a lot of professional development. So, um, just kind of trying to trying to relax and not take things too serious. I play golf, but, um, you know, not as much as I'd like to, right? I have two kids. My kids are uh, six months and like two and a half. So they're, um, so they're super young yet. So, you know, I used to work out every day. I used to be in great shape and, uh, you know, uh, now I'm, uh, now I'm, you know, I have a kind of a dad bod, but you know, we're, we're working on it as I, as I start sleeping through the night, it'll get a little easier. Right. But, um, in general, I spent a lot of time with my kids, which is good. And, uh, you know, for the most part, working out is the big thing working out, uh, you know, listen, I listen to a lot of books on tape and I try to try to get my meditation in and just try to be um, as focused and centered as possible. Although that's uh, easier said than done. Cause you know, when you're, when you got a lot of stuff going on uh, property wise, it is stressful. Don't let anybody tell you it's not right. Having a lot of properties, having a lot of stuff going on, a lot of people are answering to you, a lot of property, a lot of problems, a lot of money going out, but you know, it's, it's all worth it because you love it. Right. So. No. Oh yeah, dude. I love the meditation. Uh, I'm actually starting a process that's it, it's they call it walking meditation. I'm changing it over to driving meditation. Uh, but basically, you're just looking for good things in the environment at all times. So I that's why I wanted to do even the driving part of it because well, driving around here is stressful. So instead of saying "fuck you" for cutting me off, I say, "Hey, you must be having a really rough day. I hope you have a better day from now." On. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Try to try to see the silver linings, and I'm like I'm like the ultimate optimist, right? Is that I'm always like you know, you know it's all going to be okay. It's all for a reason, right? I, I try not to let negative stuff dwell, right? And like you know, that's just that's something you learn after, and that wasn't always me, right? But that's just something you learn after time, right? So like, who I am now as an investor and as a person is totally different than I was five years ago, right? And a lot of it is like the personal development. I've, I you know I've done different books, I've read it, just trying to be be centered and be the best person possible. Right. And like, you know, also when you get to like, you know, be in the real estate world, especially now where things are a little bit leaner, you see people that are doing things the wrong way. Right. And you just got to always do things the right way. You got to always have a positive attitude and you know, you got to just, you got to always just be the best person you can be. Right. And you can't let yeah. bad, you can't let bad get you down. You can't dwell on your, on your, on your failures and you can't dwell on your victories. Right. You kind of got to just stay, stay in the moment, stay present and do all you can. So. I love that. I was going to ask you for a quote, but I think that just hit that one. Uh, and yeah, real estate agents, especially investors, we always got to be looking out for our communities. We can't just be looking out for ourselves. You look out for your community, you'll be you'll be fine. Um, you mentioned you like to read. Any books you want to suggest out there? Um, I, I, like I would say, like you know, from a beginning standpoint, like Rich Dad Poor Dad was probably like the most trend, you know, probably the easiest answer. But that's really what got me into it, right? That's what got me into real estate, and that's what you know, that's what really kind of change things for me, right? So, um, you know, now I'm trying to read different books off based on what I'm trying to do, or like right now I'm reading books on how to analyze bigger commercial deals and apartment buildings, because ultimately I'd like to start, you know, as I have some of these singles coming up this year, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna sell them versus rent them, right? So um, just trying to look into how to get bigger, better. And, you know, I don't know what that next evolution is for myself as an investor, but um, I'd imagine it's, more uh, more doors left buildings right as opposed to tr try to play the monopoly game right where i got a lot of i got a lot of singles laid out and then how do i kind of condense those and you know get some bigger better uh, bigger better deals going on so we'll have to uh bring you back on after you learn the 1031 process so that we can learn it too yeah sounds good yeah hopefully uh hopefully i get something else if anybody any listeners out there want to uh have some apartment buildings or something offline you know we'll always pay some pay some finder's fees and everything else and uh yeah, I mean, uh, I can you know give your listeners my uh, like yes, my work email or whatever else, and uh, you know if you guys ever had any questions or you want to talk about anything, I also come across some deals all wholesale from the time being, or you know if anybody else has any deals they're looking to do, or you know have any deals they're looking to wholesale or whatever else. I mean, I'm around, I'm always buying, um, you know. So and uh, my uh, my email is um, 
my first name dot last name at gmail.com. So I'm not sure if it's going to be on the, uh, the yep. notes. So it yeah, will be. Yeah, that's the best way to get a hold of me if anybody else wants to connect or, you know, just shoot me an email, say hi, and, uh, you know, connection, connections are powerful, right? The, you know, it's, about, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, and, you know, I'm always open to network with anybody or anything. So. This industry is all about your network. Um, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, even if it's just your lawyer, your banker, and your title company all working together so that they all, you know, know each other's processes and who to reach out to when stuff are needed. So, yeah, it's all about that network. Yeah, it's uh, about, you know, how, how can we add value to each other, right? Ultimately, you know, a rising tide, uh, what do they say? Rising tide uh, raises all ships, right? So, any, every we, one of us does better, we all do better, so. Yeah, I've learned jumping around is not better for everybody. To find find people that work well together, keep them together, and keep that network going. Um, and then it just becomes your own personal little network, and it works really well together. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, th thanks for having me today, Paul. I do appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, my uh, my my past experiences have uh, will help uh, alleviate some some growing pains for anybody else out there, or you know, try to try, try to keep you from making some of the mistakes I did. So. Andrew, you've been awesome. Uh, but yes, that is uh, the end of our episode of the Atomic Real Estate Show today. Uh, there will be more actionable, atom-sized bits of advice that will be free for the taking in our next episode. So be sure to tune in next week. Thank you again to our listeners and especially Andrew for giving all of his fun little advice today, even his backward stuff that is all for you guys. Take that advice, run with it. Don't let his mistakes be your mistakes. You got his email, reach out to him. Uh, reach out to him for all of his positives. He's going to teach you some insights as well. But thank you. We appreciate you all. This has been a Direct Subs production. Check them out at directsubs.com. I look forward to hearing from all of you in our comments. And please remember to like, share, follow, and subscribe wherever you choose to listen to the Atomic Real Estate Shop. Be 1% better, everybody. If you enjoyed our episode, please consider supporting the show by rating and reviewing the podcast. Also, check us out on Instagram at Atomic Real Estate Show to find out when new shows drop and to participate in our community Q&As. The Atomic Real Estate Show was brought to you by Direct Subs. Direct Subs is the number one place for real estate investors to connect with local contractors for their flips, rentals, renovations, and new construction projects.